the fear of karma is the beginning of wisdom. That's what it is all about. You do uh, things that you think are bad and therefore there are bad consequences. Actions are like seed. If you sow bad seed, you reap bad harvest of uh, bad results. If you sow good seeds, uh, you harvest good results. Good things happen to you. Now, it is very interesting that there should be this need to redefine the proverb that the fear of karma is the beginning of wisdom because my earliest experiences of coming to California uh, had sort of stunned me. One of the first visits to California we came and stayed in the home of uh, Tom and Linda Wolf who were pastoring what was then the church on Brady. He had discovered me through our book on William Carey and we spent a few days in their home speaking in different places here in Ca Southern California and um, uh, somewhere during that week uh, Tom said that you know you should make our home as your home. Uh, this home is never locked. We live here 365 days a year whether we are here or we are not here. Our home is never locked. We don't even know if we have a key to our house. So you should just feel free to come in whether we are here or whether we have gone to Indonesia. You never need to ask us whether you can come and stay with us. Open the door, get in, find a place, uh, make yourself at home. I was shocked uh, because we had been hearing that Los Angeles uh, was ruled by gangs, terrible gangs. Uh, it was that time. So to find that there are people who never locked their houses uh, showed that there was something amazing because that does not happen in most of the non-Western world. Well, then our daughter started studying at Loma Linda and we would come once in a while to visit her. And as we drove around, we saw this amazing phenomenon of uh, orange groves, piles of bags of oranges lying in front of these gardens. And you can go and put two dollars in a box and take a bag or two bags or three bags. And if you don't put the money, there is no one to, there to watch you. And there is no one there uh, recording uh, who is stealing, who is paying, who is not paying. Uh, and we began to realize that the idea that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom had created a uniquely ethical society. The West was ethical and moral in uh, a way that the rest of the world was not. I might uh, illustrate that point in another culture as we go along. Uh, but right now, let me just make that statement that uh, the West had a unique morality which was based on the notion that the fear of God was the beginning of wisdom. But that idea or that ethics was undermined by the development of secular humanism or a materialistic or naturalistic idea which showed through philosophers such as Immanuel Kant and Nietzsche uh, that human mind could not really know whether the universe was ultimately moral or amoral. That if you do evil, will there be a final justice or if you do righteousness and suffer for righteousness, will there be a final reward? Because in this life what we often observe is that the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. There is some reward and punishment some balancing of books, uh, you can c call it trial balances there, but the final audit does not happen in this world. So ultimately a wicked man, say Stalin who killed millions of people could in fact die uh, in comfort in his home uh, if one could die in comfort and have state funeral. So. Uh, you don't see him reaping the consequences of his bad life. Is this really a moral universe? Uh, Kant, Nietzsche and other philosophers are saying 
that we can never know if the universe is in fact moral. And this problem that human philosophy, human mind by itself without the aid of divine revelation cannot know whether the universe is moral means that philosophically we need some foundation for ethical behavior. Now, I uh, began to experience why someone who has really grown up in a secular home, uh, who has no idea of the fear of God, of heaven or hell, or final judgment, etc., can find this idea of karma and reincarnation uh, so uh, intriguing and important. We were in Masuri, North India, up on the hills, Himalayan hills. My wife was teaching there, our daughters were studying there. My wife was in fact working in the library and our daughters were studying there. And there was a American single dad, Phil, who was living and uh, just um, about five minutes walk from our home. And his daughter was studying with our daughter in the third grade. Now, uh, those of you who know my wife Ruth, you know that she's always ministering and she felt particularly uh, responsible for this single dad who is, was doing a PhD, uh, so working very hard, but also having to bring up this daughter by himself. So Ruth was uh, getting involved in taking some of the responsibility for that girl. Uh, one day, a uh, domestic uh, helper, cook, who used to cook for this uh, young man, a uh, PhD scholar, he, uh, he, he also used to do all the shopping for him because uh, the electricity was very unreliable. You had to buy the fresh milk and vegetables and meats every day. Now, Phil was uh, constantly engaging people on the hillside. He had just come to believe in karma and reincarnation and he was very excited about it as a new convert. So, he was really promoting these ideas that this is great insight and incidentally his PhD subject uh, was on, uh, on the uh, history of Ramayana which is one of uh, the Hindu scriptures. Originally, it wasn't a scripture and he was researching how did it become uh, holy scriptures on Ramcharit Manas of Tulsidas to be exact. That's what he was uh, researching on. So, he had been trying to persuade many of us to believe in karma and reincarnation. Now, one day his uh, cook ran away with a uh, little bit of change and it was probably no more than five dollars, though in Indian rupees that was quite a bit of uh, money for him. Uh, this cook said he was going shopping, but in, in fact he ran away with this money. So, uh, he was very upset because he had a lot of work to do and this daughter to feed and now he has to go and uh, do the groceries, shopping, come back which is an hour's walk down the hill and up the hill and uh, then cook etc. So, he was very irritated and this was summer season, the peak uh, tourist season. So, it was very difficult to get another uh, cook and obviously this cook had gone into some hotel which was paying him much more. Uh, so, he was uh, he had become a temporary chef in a hotel which was trying to cope with the tourist rush. So, this um, uh, as he was uh, struggling, uh, Ruth was helping him find another cook, but she did not succeed. So, about if two, three weeks later, uh, Ruth ran into his cook and he spoke really nicely and politely and gently and Ruth felt that he must have had a change of heart. Uh, you know, she is very forgiving, that is why we have been together for 31 years. <laughs> so, uh, she, she thought that he uh, must have had a change of heart. So, promptly wrote a letter to Phil that you know I just saw your cook, he is back and he seems to have changed. Uh, maybe you should hire him, that would be one way of recovering uh, your uh, 200 rupees or 5 dollars or whatever it was. Well, Phil unfortunately had an American sense of justice and he was furious. Uh, he came 
uh, knocked at the door. You know, we didn't have telephones, so you couldn't take appointment. You just had to go and knock it if you wanted to meet someone. So he just came, knocked at my door. I was writing. I came out. I didn't particularly enjoy uh, that uh, interruption to what I, whatever I was doing. I don't remember what I was doing. But he began just uh, expressing his anger and frustration that how dare your wife say that I should hire this uh, fellow. He is not a cook, he is a crook. He stole this from me and that from someone else and that from someone else. Uh, he doesn't need a job, he needs jail. He, uh, the least that we should do up here on the hillside is uh, for all of us to join together to make sure that no one will hire him. Well, I didn't really know what was going on because I had been traveling, now I've come back and I'm busy trying to meet some deadline and uh, both of us must have been uh, writing uh, and very intense so neither of us was particularly polite. In fact, I did something very mean. Uh, I, uh, b since I didn't know the background of what he's talking about, uh, when he went on and on and on for half an hour and I just listened, I didn't say anything, he began to suspect that maybe I was not with him. So he asked me, don't you think that uh, this man needs to be punished, uh, that no one should hire him on this hillside? I said, you know, Phil, maybe you had stolen 200 rupees from him in your previous life. <laughs> uh, well, Phil just laughed um, and began scratching his head and he said, well, maybe not in previous life, maybe in this life I had cheated someone of... Uh, uh, 200 rupees, so my 200 rupees is now gone, so maybe I shouldn't be complaining. Maybe what has happened to me is not injustice, but justice, um, etc., etc. Uh, he completely changed and then decided to go away. Now, the point that I was obviously making with that one simple statement was his enthusiasm for the doctrine of karma and reincarnation as a possible explanation for the moral nature of the universe was a double-edged sword. It could explain that, yes, if you steal, uh, you will lose money, but then uh, if uh, it leads you to believe, as Shirley MacLaine taught and many of the New Age teachers taught, that the karma and reincarnation shows that this universe is a perfect system of cause and effect, of justice, then when someone kills you or rapes you or robs you, you have no way of knowing whether he is giving you justice or injustice because you may have murdered him in your previous life and he is simply inflicting justice, uh, give, administering cosmic justice to you rather than doing something which is unjust. Uh, we'll return to this question, but the, um, for now, the point that I want to convey is simply this, that people like Phil who are excited about uh, the ideas, philosophical ideas of karma and reincarnation feel that secular worldview provides no foundation for ethics and leaves you for, with arbitra arbitrary ethical relativism, but karma and reincarnation might in fact provide philosophical foundations for ethics, but not only for ethics, but also for a notion of personal significance. Let me explain that point very simply, that uh, this is water and this is uh, a bottle with something could be ink, could be poison, could be a medicine. If some of it is dropped, there's action and there is reaction. Now, is this bottle responsible for what has happened here? If this has become poison, harmful, or it has become medicine, beneficial to us, is this bottle responsible? Well, it is responsible if it makes a moral choice if it chose to do what it did intentionally to either heal you or to kill you. Do we make real decisions 
out of free will to either bless, heal, or harm other people. Part of what happened with the development of secular thought, uh, beginning in fact with Darwin. Now, Darwin wrote uh, in 1859 his book, The Origin of Species. A uh, few years later, in 1872, he wrote another book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And he basically argued that human emotions may simply be evolved versions of animal emo emotions. Twelve years later, the American philosopher William James, he wrote a very influential essay called What is an Emotion? And he gave a very materialistic or naturalistic interpretation of what is an emotion. And he argued that emotion is sum total of all the bodily changes, our hormones, our instincts, uh, whatever is happening with us, uh, the expression of all the sum total of all those changes is an emotion. So, it is a completely materialistic thing. Now, that became very influential, it, it influenced Freud's view that uh, human behavior uh, was not in any way spiritual behavior, there was no soul, no spirit. Uh, but it was uh, a product of our chemistry and all that we had learned and was stored there in our subconscious mind that resulted in what we did. So, if someone is um, a serial rapist and killer, it is not because he is making any real moral choices, but because of the way his father brought him up, uh, mistreated him or whatever the cause. So, a person does not make real moral choices, because he is not a spiritual person. Now, the behavioral school of psychology with uh, Watson and Skinner, they uh, were most upfront about it. Uh, Skinner in fact wrote beyond freedom and dignity and Watson in his book uh, in, in 1913 made the famous statement that for us who be, be, uh, believe or adhere to the behaviorist school of psychology. There is no qualitative distinction between man and brute. Man is an animal. There is no soul, there is no self, there is no free will. Now, this whole development of uh, western secular thought has undermined any idea of personal significance. Uh, do we make real choices? Are we responsible? Are we valuable in any sense? Or are we simply uh, machines, biochemical, electrical machines, biological machines, who do what we are determined to do by internal compulsions, but there is no question of free will, because there is no soul or spirit or self. Now, psychologists such as Freud and Jung uh, talked uh, quite a bit about uh, self, uh, but, but they were really expressing uh, their cultural upbringing like Jung's father was a Presbyterian minister. And that is what he was expressing uh, when he talked about self, a sort of memory of Christian worldview. But Jung and his followers have come to conclude that in fact, uh, since there is no God or we do not know anything about God, if there is no God there cannot be self, there cannot be soul. Man is a biological machine and therefore, there is no free will. Now, this is again something which uh, haunts many postmodern uh, minds and therefore, the idea of reincarnation gives a sense of personal significance that death is not my end, my soul will continue to reincarnate. So, when we say that postmodern uh, west is meeting premodern east, uh, it is rejecting naturalism or secular humanism or materialism, that matter al alone is real, God is not there, spiritual world is not there, you are not spiritual being. That whole outlook is being rejected in favor of something, ideas such as karma and reincarnation, which might give 
uh, possible explanations to the questions of ethics and questions of personal significance. So, if you, if you raise a question, for example, why is a child born healthy and another child born handicapped, blind, or lame, or crippled in some way? Well, the, the problem is that you have to say, well, this is by chance. This universe is regulated by chance. There is no ultimate morality in the universe. That's one possible answer. The other possible answer is that the creator is a poor creator, as many Gnostics felt. He's a terrible creator. He didn't know what he was doing. He did some things right, some things terrible. And the creator is responsible. He may be a mean, sadist creator who takes delight and pleasure in inflicting this kind of suffering. Or you can believe uh, that no, in fact, the universe is a perfect system of justice, and this child is reaping what he sowed in his previous lives. What has happened to this child is a result of his or her own choices and actions in previous lives. Or, of course, you can accept a Judeo-Christian perspective that the world we live in is not the normal world. It was perfect once upon a time, created by a perfect God, but it has become abnormal. It is marred. It is not what the Creator intended. Creator is right now involved in redeeming and saving this world, changing it, transforming it. So there will be a future hope for individuals as well as for this world, but right now what we see is not uh, what it was meant to be. So, you have those four options, and the third option that perhaps the child is uh, reaping the consequences of his or her own karma from previous life uh, is a possible explanation, a moral explanation of why this child is born the way he or she is born. There are many advantages to believing in the uh, philosophy of karma and reincarnation. You know, it um, can explain inequality. Why is someone born in a rich country and someone else in very poor circumstances where he or she does not have an opportunity to study or find good job or find dignity or find individual human rights and fulfillments? It can explain child prodigies. How is it that a six-year-old uh, girl uh, who has barely spent few months learning violin or flute or whatever can outperform someone who has spent 20 years, 30 years uh, perfecting that skill? The um, belief in karma and reincarnation could explain sort of Deja vu ex experiences that you know you have never been uh, in this particular place, but when you actually get there, see this place, you have a feeling that you've been here before. And you can, in fact, predict some of the things and that they may, in fact, turn out to be true. How does that happen? Or love at first sight, that you see someone, you immediately fall in love, and you feel that you've been. Uh, together for all eternity and should be together for all eternity. Now, these experiences are uh, karma and reincarnation that fate has uh, brought you together, that uh, there are unfulfilled or incomplete karmas to be worked out, uh, are there. Uh, several philosophers, such as David Hume, uh, argued that the Hindu idea of the soul or the idea of soul in karma and reincarnation is more symmetrical than the biblical idea. Uh, if the soul is endless, eternal, immortal, then how can it have a beginning? So it must be beginningless. You, a child must have existed before, therefore it continues afterwards. So it uh, appears to be a more symmetrical idea. Um, and. Um, you can think of many other uh, advantages of uh, belief, the 
uh, proponents of the theories uh, uh, keep um, um, promoting or uh, advancing many different arguments. One of the strong arguments is obviously that if you believe in karma and reincarnation, you are in great company because all the great sages and saints of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, the ancient Egyptians and some Greeks like Plato and many modern philosophers have in fact believed in some kind of uh, reincarnation. So, th those are uh, the, the uh, advantages of believing in uh, theories of karma and reincarnation and a person might become a believer for any one or more of those reasons. But if you begin to ask what is the evidence that reincarnation happens, then uh, you have essentially two evidences, two lines of evidences. One is the evidence under hypnosis. Well, we remember things and we forget things, but many of the things that are forgotten are in fact there in our subconscious, they are suppressed. And under hypnosis, uh, often these suppressed memories can in fact uh, come to consciousness. So, uh, the whole case for example, for the UFOs which was very popular uh, a few years ago in the west, uh, that case was built on all the evidence under hypnosis. Somebody would be saying that I was driving uh, to my farmhouse and suddenly I saw this UFO come above my car and I was kidnapped or abducted and then they did all kinds of experiments on me and I saw these aliens in this spaceship and then they put me back and they erased my memories like something like what happens in men in black. If you have seen the movie, uh, you experience aliens and they uh, take this magic or uh, um, scientific uh, uh, <laughs> band over you and then you do not remember that particular incident. But if you are hypnotized, then you might recall what happened when you were abducted in this spaceship. So, uh, a lot of the evidence for uh, past life recall comes from uh, what p subjects have reported when they were hypnotized. In 1924, in fact, uh, A. D. Rochas was the first in France, and then in 43, a Swedish researcher uh, uh, wrote about their experiments of. Uh, taking a subject, hypnotizing him or her and asking them to remember the previous decade and the moment uh, their childhood and the moment of birth and then beyond birth, before birth uh, of what kind of previous lives they have had. Now, so th these uh, serious researchers had advocated that hypnosis is a valid uh, form of evidence to take someone's memory to previous lives, but uh, uh, the other researchers and the scientific community did not find uh, those arguments or evidence convincing. In 1962, the International Journal of Parapsychology published uh, Dr. Zolik's um, very uh, authentic research on uh, reincarnation under hypnosis. And because he had done a lot of research and kept very careful records with a number of uh, uh, collaborating with a number of other scientists. What he found in his research, what he would do is uh, hypnotize a, an individual and ask them to go back and remember their previous lives and describe their previous lives and they will write all the details of what this person had lived or experienced in previous lives. Then they would bring the, uh, the subject back to normal consciousness. Later a day or two or a week later, they will hypnotize that person again and begin to scan that his memory for present life. The books that he read, the films that he saw, the plays that he saw, the st stories that he heard and try and see if the life the previous life that had been recalled, whether it was actually recalling of a previous life 
or construction mental cons uh, imaginative construction of previous life based on the stories that this person had heard and the films that he had seen and uh, etc. And uh, they correlated that in every single case the so called uh, past life that had been recalled was in fact an imaginative construction reconstruction of what the subject uh, believed had happened uh, did not actually happen. Though uh, Zolik did find in his research some evidence that uh, some subjects remember a few things if some information which does not seem to come from anything which they had uh, uh, read or heard or seen, but information which could have been gleaned what they call paranormally how they did not know, uh, but uh, they said that there, there are some minor uh, uh, experiences that people remember that cannot be accounted for by this method, but in no way uh, does this support a claim for reincarnation. So, uh, the idea of uh, evidence under hypnosis that has been uh, completely demolished, but there is the other line of evidence which is called uh, spontaneous past life recalled. A child suddenly starts saying that I was I am not so and so, I was so and so in my previous life and this may be a 6 year old child, but saying I was married my wife's name was this and my child was this and my dog was that and my city was this and you t write down all the details and begin to investigate and you find that in fact a lot of the details being given are uh, true and there is no apparent way this child. Uh, could have had that information, because no one in his village knows anything about that village or that person and that this child says had uh, is now dead. Now, uh, there are uh, obviously many different uh, specific cases that one can talk about. Dalai Lama is the best known of all the reincarnated souls. A uh, Dalai Lama <coughs> is a title, Dalai Lama is a title. Uh, to a religious and uh, a political ruler of Tibetan Buddhists until the Chinese took over Tibet, he was the ruler. And once a Dalai Lama died, it was believed that he reincarnates, so he is ruler forever. And how do you know which of the child, uh, wh where has he reincarnated as what child? The teams of other monks go out and they take with them uh, different uh, ordinary things that belong to Dalai Lama such as eyeglasses or a walking stick or robes or his cup or some such thing. And the child who recognizes, so they might put uh, f five uh, uh, eyeglasses and the child should pick up the eyeglass which actually belong to. Uh, the Dalai Lama, then you know that he remembers which one is his uh, eyeglasses, etcetera. So, uh, the, uh, it is the child's memory uh, that he gives evidence that he recognizes that these are uh, his properties and grabs them, etcetera. So, you know that this is um, the reincarnation of Dalai Lama, but obviously, uh, this is quite a bit embarrassing uh, as uh, the one's child has been selected and brought into the monastery to be trained as the next Dalai Lama. He is there for life, because everybody has accepted him as the Dalai Lama, whether he is good or bad or wicked or oppressive uh, etcetera, you are stuck with him. So, the present Dalai Lama has been saying that democracy is a better way of choosing uh, uh, democracy is better than reincarnation for choosing uh, religious and temporal rulers. We will talk a little bit more about it perhaps next week when we discuss Buddhism, but so the point is that the present Dalai Lama himself feels a bit embarrassed about this. So, he does not, uh, he often says that perhaps I will not be reincarnated and the next leader should be democratically elected etcetera. Uh, but um, 
uh, th th there are str stronger reasons why he says that and I'll come to that uh, towards the end of the lecture. But the second um, very important figure in India, uh, in fact the most influential Hindu guru or Hindu god living today is Satya Sai Baba. This is the um, 70 years or so old um, Hindu guru who lives in South India. He has hair like uh, afro style uh, forming a halo. You might have seen his picture and he has number of celebrities following him. Goldie Hawn is uh, one of his most famous uh, celebrity followers. The, they worship him as God. Now, he was born in 1940, uh, 1928 the previous Sai Baba died. This one was born as Satyanarayan Raju. When he was about 14 years old, he had an experience after which he started claiming to be the reincarnation of the earlier Sai Baba. So it's his story uh, which has influenced a lot of people to begin to believe in reincarnation. But the serious academic work on this whole question of spontaneous past life recall was done by Ian Stevenson, a professor of psychology or psychiatry and neurology in Virginia. Uh, he wrote a book called 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. In his files at that time, he had about 2000 cases where children start uh, telling uh, uh, saying that I am not so and so, but I am so and so. I lived there, I died there and I am reborn. That is my identity. So, he took all of these stories seriously and investigated and chose 20 of the best cases and published this book, which had a profound influence. I personally know um, the head of the psychology department in my university, who used to be a behaviorist and then after his encounters with Ian Stevenson and the evidence that Stevenson uh, presented, he rejected behaviorism or the idea that man is simply a biological machine in favor of an idea that man may be a spiritual being and reincarnation might actually happen. So, this is serious academic work which Ian Stevenson had done. Now, if you read his book carefully, you find that at the end of his book, he in fact begins to say that these 20 cases that I am talking about could be reincarnation, <coughs> that is one possibility, but they could also be spirit possession. In two, two of the 20 cases, for example, he says that these are definitely uh, more likely to be spirit possession. One of the boys he talked to was Jasbir. Jasbir was uh, three and a half years old, where another personality in another village, Shobharam, was poisoned, fell off an ox cart, died, a horse cart, um, Tonga, I think we call it, and, and, he, and he died. Uh, six months or so later, just when Jasbir was about four years old, he became, he had very high fever, and when he came out of his fever, he was a different person. And he began to say, uh, maybe in six years old when he had this experience, he began to say that he was not just Veer, he was Shobharam and he had been poisoned and he had died in such and such circumstances. So, those things were uh, checked out and they were confirmed. Now, Stevenson, Dr. Stevenson asked just Veer, now Shobharam, that how did you become Shobharam? He said that when he had died, when he was in the spirit world, the astral world, he met another spirit of a sadhu, which is a holy man, a wandering ascetic. And this uh, ascetic or sadhu told him to take cover in the body of Jasvir. So, I did. And he said that since then, often I have continued to meet with this sadhu, this ascetic, uh, this spirit in my dreams. So, Stevenson says that this clearly is more likely a case of spirit possession. 
And then he adds that the other cases could also be spirit possession, except that the person who died, died before the new personality was born. In this case, Jasveer was born, um, Jasveer was born before Shobharam died. Now, but Shobharam could have died before Jasveer was born and then possessed him. So, these cases could be cases of spirit possession rather than reincarnation. Now, that is most interesting, especially uh, in uh, the most interesting uh, in possible interpretation in the case of Satya Sai Baba himself. Because Satya Sai Baba was born as Satya Narayan Raju. When, when he was 14 years old, he was visiting his uncle and one evening he was stung by a big black scorpion and some of these scorpions can be really deadly. He had excruciating pain, he rolled on the ground, cried and shouted and yelled and the, but then he slept deeply at night. When he woke up the next day, he was a different person. He would laugh uncontrollably, un uncontrollably or he would cry uncontrollably. Sometimes he would be so strong that you needed half a dozen people to um, tie him down and sometime he was so weak that he could not lift a morsel of food and eat. And there was many other behaviors such as this, this is all from his official biographies. I have been to his ashram a few times um, and uh, read all of his official uh, biographies. His parents and his relatives began to believe that he was actually possessed uh, by some spirit and they took him to an exorcist. This exorcist, if, if you have ever watched exorcism in India uh, or in Nepal or in some of uh, these um, what you would call animistic cultures, the exorcist can be very brutal. Uh, I have seen, uh, seen the way they treat. So, th this uh, exorcist was beating uh, Satya Narayan Raju so badly that the parents said, well, this might actually kill him. It is better for the boy to live and be possessed than for him to be dead and delivered from the spirit. So, so they took the uh, child back home and two, three months after that he started performing miracles and then few months later he started claiming that he was the reincarnation of Sai Baba of Shirdi. Now, no one in his village apparently had heard of this Sai Baba, but he was worshipped near in Bombay part Maharashtra area, so quite well known uh, ascetic, uh, probably a Muslim who was also worshipped by many Hindus because he was not Muslim only um, by birth, but not particularly by any uh, conviction. Now, there are a number of similarities in both of the Sai Babas, both of them for example, are homosexuals uh, and uh, a number of um, details that uh, you can check out on the internet because internet is just full of him. So, the, the question is, is this a case of reincarnation or is this a case of spirit possession or is this a case of mental abnormality of multiple personality or split personality etcetera. And uh, the answer that you choose obviously depends on your world view your worldview would uh, it does not really depend on the facts by themselves, um, but on what you choose to believe. It is uh, Stevenson, Ian Stevenson in, in his book 20 cases suggestive of reincarnation. He says that there could be spirit possession, but the people I have interviewed interpret them as reincarnation. Therefore, I take their words at face value. Uh, but obviously, their interpretation is conditioned by their culture. It does not necessarily mean that this is in fact reincarnation. It is just one spirit that has forcefully possessed another spirit, another spiritual being. Now, we have looked at the advantages of belief in karma and reincarnation. What are the disadvantages of the belief in karma and reincarnation? Now, first of all, obviously, the idea uh, that cause and effect equals justice. If karma is to be a philosophical foundation for justice, 
it has to have more than cause and effect. As I said that uh, the cause of this uh, liquid turning blue was uh, uh, this um, bottle the color caused this effect, but cause and effect by themselves do not equal justice. If a husband hits his wife when she is pregnant and the child born has some handicap, some deformity, we know the cause of that effect. But because an effect has a cause, it does not become justice. So, cause and effect by themselves do not become justice. You have to postulate other things, you have to postulate that this bottle in fact made a choice to pour poison or medicine in that water. So, there was a choice uh, decision made with particular intentions, responsible free choice and then if this poison has killed a lot of people and nobody ever found out who made that decision, it is quite possible that the murderer will never be punished in this life. So, there has to be some uh, not just law, but someone some agency that enforces the law in the next life. This is where we will as we will see in few minutes uh, you have the biggest problems with the beliefs in karma and reincarnation, but let us begin with something simpler. First of all if you accept that the theories of karma and reincarnation give you a basis for believing in a in cosmic justice that this is a cosmos uh, which is just. Then the problem is that this justice has no corrective value. I do not know why I am suffering, I am starving, I am in prison or I am a refugee and my city is being bombed and I am homeless and my home is destroyed or in an earthquake or in a flood. I do not know for which particular karma I am suffering therefore, I cannot really repent and I cannot really make restitutions and I cannot ensure that I will not repeat the same mistakes, because there is no memory. Well, the second problem is that it has no exemplary value that someone else is suffering unfortunately in Lebanon or Iraq or wherever. I cannot learn anything from his suffering, because I do not know for which karma he is suffering, you know what wrong did they do, because of which they are suffering. So, so if I if I knew that well this is a terrible thing to do, because it has very bad consequences, then I can uh, be helped, but it has no exemplary value. But <clears throat> more than that, this understanding of justice undermines compassion uh, profoundly. What karma and reincarnation does is turns this life, this world into a prison. A soul is incarnated here to take the consequences of what it did in previous lives. So, if this child is suffering blind or crippled or whatever, uh, mentally deficient, uh, challenged, uh, you can use politically correct language if you desire, but uh, w whatever. If this child is suffering because of what he or she did in previous lives, then for me to try and step in and relieve that suffering is like breaking a jail to let a prisoner out cut short his suffering. Obviously, I cannot succeed in uh, interfering with this cosmic justice, but if I did actually succeed, <clears throat> I will only make matters worse for him and for myself, because if I cut short his suffering in this life, poor fellow will have to be reborn to complete his due term of suffering 
and then I will have to be punished for interfering with cosmic justice. Now, this is uh, the main reason that why although Buddha talked a lot about compassion, that compassion never produced Mother Teresa, never be, uh, produced institutionalized compassion in Buddhist cultures, uh, because Buddha also talked about not, not being attached to anyone, like for his own enlightenment he had to be detached from his wife and his child. Detachment is necessary for enlightenment. So, you can have compassion, but it must not be compassion with commitment, because commitment means attachment. That attachment is in fact, the root cause of your own suffering. It has no corrective value, it has no exemplary value, it undermines compassion because all the suffering is cosmic justice. And as I said in that story of Philip, it in fact undermines the notion of justice itself, because when someone has stolen your money, you do not know whether he has done an injustice to you or whether he has administered cosmic justice to you. If he has administered cosmic justice to you that you had stolen from him in your previous life, then he has got what is his and he should not be sent to jail, he should not be prosecuted for it. So, one can uh, mention many other uh, issues, uh, one of the big issues obviously, behind karma and reincarnation is that it trivializes death and therefore, our individuality. In one of the most famous Hindu scriptures, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Shri Krishna, a god, is giving a discourse to Arjuna, a warrior. The warrior does not want to kill his cousins, his uncles, his teachers for the sake of these five little villages of Hastinapur. Uh, this is not worth it, uh, this uh, massacre. But Arjuna says, No, you must do it do not be concerned about their life or death, because death is really soul changing clothes, like body changes clothes and puts on discards old clothes, dirty clothes, take, takes on new clothes uh, and that is what soul does, it uh, discards old body, takes on new body. So, death is only an entry into a new body and new life. Therefore, there was never a time when you and I were not there and these people were not there and there will never be a time when you and I or these uh, people will not be there. Therefore, do your duty, go ahead and kill. Uh, so, it trivializes death, it is not evil, it is not something that should be resisted, fought against and everything done uh, to give life, save life. Uh, and resist death, but not only death is trivialized, but by that very fact individuality is trivialized. Today you are so and so, tomorrow you will be born as Mrs. so and so or Miss so and so and day after tomorrow you will be someone else and you might be a rat and you might be a cockroach. So, you um, me as Vishal Mangalwadi has no permanent individual significance, because I will be someone else, something else in my next life. So, the notion of inalienable individual rights, fundamental human rights, this notion never developed in India, because uh, this idea of karma and reincarnation uh, trivializes both death and individual personality. But the most uh, serious problem with belief in karma and reincarnation is a very simple and profound question and that is what exactly is reincarnating? What is reincarnating? Now, in popular language particularly in the west after the new age movement, you assume that it is soul which is reincarnating. 
But in Hinduism and Buddhism, which are philosophically far more developed systems than the New Age movement here in the West, they understand that soul is in fact an illusion. Are there many different souls? Hinduism teaches that no, your soul is in fact, it is not a finite soul, it is the infinite self, it is God. God is within you, you are God, I am God, everyone is God, everything is God. Now, this is something which we will look at in detail uh, two weeks from now when we discuss Hinduism. But for now, if even if you have a hard time believing how everyone can be God and there is only one God, there is only one reality, everything is God, then the idea of individual soul is an illusion. So, uh, if you go on the internet and you begin to check on reincarnation and Hinduism and you look at more thoughtful websites uh, where Hindus are writing about reincarnation themselves, they would say that yes, when you are enlightened, you realize that all of those individualities and the whole idea of individuality was an illusion. So, what is reincarnating? An illusion is reincarnating. God has forgotten that he is God and is suffering this endlessly until he realizes that he is actually God. He never was an individual, he never did incarnate. All of this was an illusion. So, in Hinduism, uh, there is no individual soul which reincarnates. Buddhism understands that and therefore, <clears throat> while Hinduism would really say that it is illusion which reincarnates, not soul, Buddhism would say it is karma which reincarnates. Not illusion, but karma. Now, what does that mean? There is no soul. Now, Buddha could not believe in soul because he did not believe in God. If God does not exist, you cannot exist as a soul. If God as a spirit being does not exist, you cannot have a real existence. So, what is it that it reincarnates? You know, one king asked a Hindu monk, uh, if there is no soul, then what is reincarnating? Uh, the monk took a candle which was lit and touched another candle which was not lit and the second candle caught the fire. And the monk asked, did a soul pass from this candle into another candle? Obviously not, only karma passed, only action passed. So, one actions have reactions and therefore, the Buddhists intellectuals would say that while well, Buddha did talk about reincarnation, but he did not mean that soul actually reincarnates. He simply used what people already popularly believed, a myth that people believed and used that myth to teach them some moral behavior. That is all he was doing. Every action including every moral action does have a reaction uh, like the soul has not passed from here to there, this liquid did change. So, action has a reaction, but no soul has passed, uh, only some qualities have passed. So, unfortunately what the new age movement does when it tries to find personal significance that I am not a machine uh, a, uh, an animal which will disintegrate at death and which will be the end. You no, know, in fact, I will continue to live. It tries to inject a Christian idea of the soul or self or spirit into the idea of uh, karma and reincarnation, which is built on a philosophy which says that there is no real uh, individual soul. Now, it does not make any sense to you, uh, but it will if you come next uh, Wednesday and the Wednesday after that, then it will begin to make sense. So, let us begin to wind up. I said that the fundamental problem with the theory of karma and reincarnation is the question, what is reincarnating? And I have said that if you accept the Hindu 
uh, Buddhist idea of no soul, no individual soul. Hinduism would say that there is a world soul, cosmic soul, God. Hinduism, Buddhism would say that there is no God, so it's only karma which is reincarnating. Uh, either way, whether it's illusion which is reincarnating or karma which is reincarnating, at the end of the day, both Hinduism and Buddhism in their sophisticated philosophical versions would say that karma and reincarnation is in fact illusion. The reason that they have to say that is because ultimately time is an illusion. And that is something which part of the New Age movement did understand. Shirley MacLaine, for example, had a very extensive, uh, I think two chapters, half the book on, uh, uh, on the concept of nowness, where she is talking with Stephen Hawking and going into the physics of time. What is time? And she concludes the, the basis of back to the future um, stories that time is unreal. If time is unreal, then obviously reincarnation is unreal. Or what she propounds nowness, the reason she can go back into her previous lives uh, through acupuncture or meditation or spirit guides. She can also go into her future lives and predict what uh, and foresee uh, what her future lives are. So there is past life recall and there is future life uh, recall. Uh, memory can regress under hypnosis and it can also progress under hypnosis because time is not real. Now, that is another uh, uh, long discussion which I would leave for the question answer time if you want to take that up, uh, but you might have other questions. But that is the, the concept of time is the second important reason why Hinduism and Buddhism ultimately have to say that karma and reincarnation, the whole theory is illusion, is unreal, it is not it does not happen, it is not there. So, what we, the, the question then is that we are back to square one, how are we to find philosophical foundations for faith in morality, <coughs> philosophical foundations for personal significance, am I real, do I make real choices? Will those choices have consequences? Now, you will see a lot of New Age people and a lot of Hindus and Buddhists today who would say that in fact the Bible teaches reincarnation, Jesus believed in reincarnation, etc. But the church uh, rejected this doctrine, the, particularly the Catholic Church was the wicked church which rejected all these doctrines, ruled them out in this church councils, etc. This is a very popular myth uh, floating around us. Well, the reality is that some of the Gnostic sects did believe in reincarnation and the church did reject that idea of reincarnation. The reason the church rejected was not because of any power struggle, but because Jesus had not been reincarnated. Jesus resurrected. His tomb was empty. His crucified body was not there in the tomb the third day. It had been glorified and it had been resurrected. So, because Jesus resurrected, Biblical Christianity has affirmed resurrection rather than reincarnation. What resurrection does, it affirms your individuality that you are a special unique individual and you will continue to live forever. You are valuable because you are an immortal soul. You are so precious that God's own son came to this earth to die for you, to be buried and to rise again to give you eternal life. So, resurrection affirms the significance of your personal value, your relationships. Jesus recognized his disciples, they recognized him. He was the same person in a glorified body, same relationships continuing forever beyond this life. So, that is where the personal significance comes uh, into question but also ethics, because what resurrection means 
is that death is not the end. We continue to live and exist beyond personal physical death and we remain accountable to God. We will be judged. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Our sins will be punished and our righteousness will be rewarded like Jesus' righteousness and faith was re rewarded with resurrection life, with eternal life, our faith and righteousness will be rewarded with resurrection life. There will be a final judgment. There will be opening of books. Everything that I have thought, everything that I have said, everything that I have done is recorded. It's recorded in my own brain, in my own subconscious mind. And these books will be opened. I will be judged. Now this is what in fact <clears throat> created the proverb, this concept, this philosophy that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If America became a society where right here in Los Angeles you can leave your house open uh, 365 days a year, even if you're going to Indonesia for a month of mission trip, your house is open, it's never locked. How do you create that kind of a society? Because of the fear of God in society. And how did that fear of God come from? Well, the first great awakening in America came uh, from sermons such as Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That we are sinners, we are accountable to God, our life is like a dangling over fire, any moment it, that our hold on life can go and we will be judged. Now, a lot of people hate the idea of sinners in the hands of angry God, but Edward's hearers knew that this angry God is in fact a loving father. Sinners in the hands of a loving father, that message is in fact an invitation for sinners to return to their loving father. Because this loving father respects us as individuals. So the, the sermon could have been titled in many different ways. It's not just sinners in the hands of a loving God. It's not a, a, an angry God. Hell is not simply God's anger and wrath. It is also God's tolerance and patience. The hell is God's ultimate patience, like the father allows his prodigal son to go where he wants to and make a mess of his life as he wants to. Hell is God saying to sinners, your will be done. Well, ultimately, there are only two choices. Either we say to God that your will be done in my life, or God says to us, your will be done. If you don't want to live with your loving father in his kingdom, in his heaven, in his mansions, then you're free not to live with him, but to go with the devil where he wants to go, where he is doomed to go. So hell is not simply sinners in the, hand, the hands of an angry God. It is sinners in the hands of a loving God. And hell could be seen as God's ultimate tolerance of our free will, God's ultimate respect for our significance that we choose, as Madonna says, that I'm going to hell. What are you going to do? However the song goes. Um, it's, it's this understanding that we have rebelled against our Father and therefore this world is in a mess. Therefore there is suffering. The world is fallen. But he is redeeming because he is calling sinners to return to him. That outlook creates that proverbs, that proverb that uh, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to fear him because he might let us go our own way. And the end of our own way is hell. So let's recap. 
karma and reincarnation do not provide philosophical foundations for faith in a just universe. They do not provide philosophical foundations for a faith in our personal significance. They are no alternative to a materialistic secular worldview. The alternative to a secular worldview is in that historical event of a man who was crucified, who died, was buried and rose again on the third day. It is that event which tells us that we are indeed more than physical body, we continue to exist beyond our death, we remain accountable to God, we will be judged for our sins and our obedience of faith will also be rewarded. Thank you very much.